So good morning, Dr. Kamdar, and uh, welcome to Delhi for the AIOS. As Dr. Kamdar said, first day, first show. So you can't do a perfect trabeclectomy. There's nothing like a perfect trabeclectomy, but it's all about trying to enhance your surgical outcomes. We all want a large diffuse bleb, and uh, we'd also like to have pseudopods because they show that the uh, bleb is functioning. We want to avoid complications like an insisted bleb and flat or shallow anterior chambers. So a trabeclectomy is all about creating a passage from the anterior chamber to the so that you can lower the intraocular pressure. You'd obviously like to avoid hypotony, a flat chamber, so that peripheral anterior synechy and cataract and bleb failures don't happen. So these are signs of good blebs, good functioning blebs, a large diffuse bleb, pseudopods, thin cystic blebs. But there's been a change in thought process. We are now no longer aiming for thin cystic blebs. We want thick walled blebs because we know over a period of time the walls will thin out. So it's important that you take the patient into confidence about your decision to operate. Make sure you've got a, you've looked at the examination, you've done a good examination to assess conjunctival mobility if, if it's a repeat surgery and make sure that there's no extraocular infection which can hamper your outcome. It's always good to have an informed consent. In terms of medications, always stop aspirin and all forms of, uh, forms of blood thinners at least a week prior to surgery. Some medicines may need to be changed, each carrying an advantage. For example, if, you'd, if the patient is on pilocarpine, it's always good to stop the pilocarpine because when you do your sclerostomy, there will be a tendency for the iris to prolapse through the sclerostomy. So once that happens, that's a sign you've got an adequate size sclerostomy. But sometimes you have to reposit the iris back. If, you, if the patient is on pilocarpine and you have a meiotic pupil, you'll have to dig in through the sclerostomy to pick up the peripheral iris to do your iridectomy. But then, Cosmetically, it gives you a better looking iridectomy as compared to when you uh, are not using pilocarpine. Adrenergics, always prefer to uh, stop them because they are adrenergic agnes and uh, promote uh, bleeding. Prostaglandin analogues are usually c continued till the day of surgery. Then comes the choice of anesthesia and most surgeries today are being done under local anesthesia. It's good to add hy hy hylase. And choice of, most of us are now using peribulbar. Topical is still not the uh, uh, anesthesia of choice. So it's a 1 is to 1 ratio of xylocaine and bupivacaine that can be used. Avoid adrenaline because it tends to produce vasoconstriction which can compromise the blood supply in a patient with an advanced glaucoma. It's important that you choose your site and usually it's a 12 o'clock position. You could go at 12 o'clock position or you could opt for a superior nasal trap. The advantage of a superior nasal trap is that you have other space available for any subsequent glaucoma surgery. But then most of us prefer to do it at 12 o'clock because if a cataract surgery is required, we can now opt for a clear corneal temporal phaco. One of the keys to good surgery is to have adequate exposure. So if you're a phonics-based surgeon for a glaucoma surgery or a trabeclectomy, a corneal traction suture works quite well, a 7 or vicral, and go through two-third of the, uh, this thing. Uh, corneal thickness, pull the globe down and you get good exposure in this area. But if you opt for a limbal based flap, then a superior rectus suture provides you with adequate exposure. Now, where should you give the first incision? So this is a phonics, a limbal based flap. The superior rectus suture has been passed. The distance from the limbus to the insertion of the superior rectus is about 7.8 millimeters. So that's about the space you need to be close to 8 millimeters away from the limbus. So idly, a little posterior to the insertion of the superior rectus is a good landmark. Just close to it, make a nick with your uh, uh, corneal scissors and use, always use uh, blunt instruments. Avoid using tooth instruments for the conjunctiva and the tenons. Make a nick and then your blade should go two-thirds all the way to create two, uh, two clock hours on either side where you want to create the flap. And once you come to this large incision here, you can use moistened soft sticks to uh, Posterior to push the conjunctiva and the tenons back anteriorly. So this is just to show you how you identify the area of the limbus. You've dissected the tenons and the conjunctiva all the way back. While you do that in a limbal base flap, remember that uh, do not disinsert the tenons here. So if you look at the insertion, the conjunctiva uh, inserts and one millimeter behind that is the insertion of the tenons. The advantage of keeping this, this insertion intact is that this makes sure that the anterior wall of your bleb 
is, is adhesive enough and doesn't tend to leak because this is one of the common sites and it happens when you uh, disinsert the tenon. So your barrier gets reduced over here. Apply gentle cautery because uh, when you apply too much cautery, the, uh, uh, the sclera tends to contract and that can produce uh, wound leakage later on. But again, cautery should be gentle, not excessive and still adequate enough to ensure that once you start your surgery, there's no bleeder which pops up because if you apply a cautery, it could lead to increased aqueous outflow at that site. To increase surgical outcomes, many of us now tend to use mitomycin or 5-fluorouracil. It can be applied on the, we can apply it on the scleral surface before we create our triangular or rectangular flap. Some people use it both on the scleral bed after the triangular flap has been uh, made. So this is a triangular flap. I like to use a Bart Parker knife with a 10 and an 11 number blade. So this is an 11 number blade you see here. Create your triangular flap such that the base is about 4 millimeters. Once you have this uh, triangular insertion, you can carry the dissection forward with a 15 number Bart Parker knife all the way. Ensure that you don't get a uh, button holding of the conjunctiva. These are some of the important landmarks you see here. Look at this blue, uh, change from white to blue, which is actually clear cornea, which is starting. And just here is the sclera turning into this area. So the landmarks are important because when you create your rectangular flap, it ha the anatomical landmarks have to be kept in mind. So the white part and the starting of this zone here is where the sclera ends. And the white part and the blue zone where it starts corresponds to the termination of the Bowman's membrane. The scleral spur is just anterior to where the sclera ends. And the trabecular meshwork is in this zone. So if we know these landmarks, we'll make sure that uh, we don't run into a problem. The scleral block should never be posterior to the scleral spur because then you're going to go and touch the ciliary processes over here. And if you're doing a trabeculotomy, all you need to do is make a radial incision here to identify Schlem's canal. Use a curved Vana scissors to uh, pick up this uh, scleral, uh, dissect the scleral flap, the deep block. And once you got the deep block, ideally, I like the iris to prolapse through the sclerostomy, which tells me that I have an adequate size sclerostomy. Use a Vana scissors and a, and a limbs forceps to pick up and create. Now, the, when you do this, creating your peripheral iridectomy, the scissors blade should be parallel to the limbus. This will make sure that you have a broad-based uh, iridectomy. You don't need to go in and push the iris in. You can just use an iris repositor and gently press. The iris tends to go back if pilocarpine has not been uh, used. And what I normally do is I place a, a releasable suture at the apex and uh, two wing sutures on either side. And it's good to assess the egress of aqueous here, either through a paracentesis incision. So this is how I normally close the conjunctiva because I do only glaucoma surgeries and no cataracts. I have enough time. I close the tenons in the first go, continuous interlocking with the 80 vicle, and I come back to close the uh, conjunctiva subsequently. So again, as Dr. Carte had said, the need for a glaucoma surgery arises when you feel that the intraocular pressure is a threat to the patient's vision. There are certain I, uh, clues that you can get. So for example, patients who are myopes, you don't want to lower the intraocular pressure too much because they have a tendency to go into hypotony. Folds in the ILM are more commonly reported amongst them. So here's your checklist. Plan your anesthesia. Make sure, usually for adults, the local anesthesia is preferred. Make sure that you have a corneal or a superior rectus suture there so that you get good exposure to the globe. The corneal suture works well if you're a phonics-based surgeon and the superior rectus suture works well for traction if you are a limbal-based surgeon. So we want large diffuse blebs which are not cystic and relatively thick walled. You could consider the use of mitomycin. Your scleral flap could be rectangular or triangular. That doesn't matter. The success is not dependent on the shape of the flap. Anterior chamber, the decompression needs to be avoided and, an anterior, and you could actually uh, push in air through a paracentesis incision. And uh, pre-placed sutures is another way of trying to ensure that decom uh, the uh, decompression doesn't happen quickly. And when you close the conjunctiva, there's obviously a difference when you do it. If you're a, if you're a limbal-based surgeon, 8-0 vicle is all right to close the tenons and the conjunctiva. But if you're using a phonics-based flap, then most people actually like to suture the edges 
and sometimes put a reinforcement suture in the middle of the uh, scleral flap. Post-op follow-up becomes very important because a glaucoma surgery